Okay, uh, anaerobic digestion of finishing cattle manure is my topic for today. Uh, so I want to talk about anaerobic digestion in context of this whole integrated biorefinery system. In Nebraska, at least, it would be fairly common to have a lot of grain production, uh, specifically corn. Uh, that grain production then goes to an ethanol plant quite frequently uh, right now for ethanol production. A byproduct coming out of that then is distiller's grains. Uh, distiller's grains fed to feedlot cattle. Manure from that feedlot uh, can then go into power and anaerobic digester. Thank you very much. Uh, can come in here to feed the anaerobic digester. Uh, biogas or methane production from that digester then goes up here to power the ethanol plant. Fertilizer or leftover effluent from the anaerobic digester uh, makes an excellent fertilizer then for our grain production. So it's really a nice system where each component uh, really benefits other components within the system. So for our research, we wanted to look at how does uh, using this whole system affect uh, especially anaerobic digestion and methane production. So we uh, had two objectives. The first would be to look at how distiller's grains impacts cattle performance and how it changes manure quality, how that impacts anaerobic digestion. And then secondly, uh, if we're using these open lot feedlot pins, what type of manure are we collecting out of those pins and is that a feasible feedstock for anaerobic digestion? So our two objectives were to look at the impact of cattle diet on manure quality and then secondly the impact of cattle housing on uh, ash contamination and then manure quality. So really looking at the difference between these two scenarios where we have open lot pins, uh, over 95% of the cattle in the United States would be fed in these kind of uh, scenarios to finish them out. Uh, it's a soil-based pin. That manure is sitting out there for possibly more than 100 days and really changing over time compared to this uh, type of a situation where it's maybe a cement floor or a cement pit. It's pure manure, if you'll want to call it that, uh, without the soil contamination. So uh, comparing the two scenarios. So for this uh, trial, we used seven one-liter digesters uh, with a retention time of 20 days. Uh, we did feed them a 9% dry matter manure slurry. Uh, we maintained them at 37 degrees Celsius and uh, tried to maintain a neutral pH with the addition of sodium hydroxide. Uh, we only had to use sodium hydroxide for the first few weeks after starting them. After that, they really uh, maintained that pH all by themselves. Uh, we did maintain anaerobic conditions with a constant flow of into gas through the digester. Uh, some work done by Verrill and others clear back in 1980 uh, really shows the effect of both temperature and retention time on methane production. Uh, so with the green and the red lines, these are long uh, retention times. And as you see, there's really not as much of an effective temperature. Where here with the shorter uh, three-day retention time, we really see an impact of temperature on methane production. So with our digesters, uh, we were here at about a 20-day retention time and 37 degrees Celsius, so really in the mesophilic range. We did uh, measure methane production using a methane detector from RKI Instruments. Uh, this measured concentration of methane, and we knew what the uh, constant gas flow was, and using both of those, then we were able to calculate a total methane production from each digester. We also measured both dry matter and organic matter degradation. Uh, so the feed going into the digesters was 9% dry matter or 9% total solids. Same thing, I talk dry matter, organic matter. Engineers would talk uh, total solids, volatile solids. And then we measured the dry matter and organic matter or total solids and volatile solids of the effluent coming out of the digesters to calculate uh, organic matter degradation within the digester. So looking at the two treatments, uh, this was treatment applied to the cattle. So cattle diet was either this control corn-based diet that was 82.5% dry rolled corn, 5% uh, molasses, 7.5% alfalfa, and 5% supplement that did contain some urea. Uh, we compared that then to a wet distiller's grains diet. Uh, we replaced 40% of that corn with distiller's grains. So now the diet had 47.5% dry rolled corn, 40% distillers, same level of alfalfa, and again, 5% supplement, but with no urea. We then uh, did a complete manure collection, which would be urine and feces, in a cement gutter. 
Uh, we had four steers on each diet for three days for manure collection. So this really was a urine and feces complete manure collection uh, that would be very fresh. Uh, it was analyzed and weighed into individual allotments that were then frozen until the day of feeding. Uh, it was a switchback design with seven digesters. Uh, they would have been on a treatment for 42 days, which is two complete turnovers with measurements just being made the last five days of that period. And then treatments were switched uh, ran for another 42 days with uh, measurements made the last five days. So the first question really is what happens to cattle performance when we include distiller's grains in the diet? A meta-analysis done by Bremer and others in 2011 uh, compares a wet distiller's grains diet, which is in the blue, to modified distillers in the red and a dry <coughs> distillers in the green. The only difference between these three products would be the moisture content of the distiller's grain. So there's no other changes, just uh, how dry is the product. And we compare that back to the zero level, uh, which would be that corn-based control, no distiller's grains in the diet. And we're just looking at efficiency of the cattle, so how much do they gain for every pound of feed that we give them. Uh, so we really see a nice response with distiller's grains with increased efficiency, uh, no matter which product. But for this trial, we would have been using this corn-based control and carrying, uh, comparing that to a 40% wet distiller's grains diet. Uh, within the cattle, uh, digestibility is actually decreasing when we feed distiller's grains. Uh, Corrigan and others showed this in 2009. Both organic matter and dry matter digestibility of the feed uh, linearly decreases. So again, we're comparing this 0% distiller's grain corn control diet. Uh, to a 40% distiller's grains diet. Uh, Luby and others also showed the same thing with, again, uh, organic matter uh, digestibility linearly declining with the addition of uh, distiller's grains to the diet. Here they took a zero corn control, compared that to 15, 30, 45, or 60% distiller's grains. Decreasing digestibility as you increase the amount of distiller's grains and increasing fecal organic matter output, measured as kilograms of organic matter uh, output per day. So if you're designing an anaerobic digester, it's very important to take into account what kind of diet uh, the cattle are consuming because that will affect how much manure is uh, produced and how big the digester needs to be. So now results from this trial. So what was happening inside of the digesters? If we control, uh, compare the control manure to the distiller's grains manure, really not very many differences. Uh, slightly higher nutrients, uh, especially phosphorus, is going to be higher in that uh, distiller's grains manure. And then if we compare uh, manure to effluent, really the organic matter is decreasing in that digester and nutrients are about doubling. So we see uh, phosphorus going from less than 2% to about 4.5%, no matter if it's the control or the distiller's grains digesters. Uh, dry matter uh, degradation and organic matter degradation were both slightly higher for the distiller's grains manure. Uh, we see 44.9% for dry matter de degradation compared to 42.7% uh, for the control uh, with a p-value of 0.05. Organic matter degradation, same story uh, with a p-value of 0.1. So just slightly higher uh, degradation with the distiller's grains manure. Methane production, again, slightly higher with a p-value of 0.1. Uh, methane production for those distillers, grains, digesters, 0.634 liters per day compared to 0.551 liters per day for those control digesters. Uh, if we break it down a little bit differently and uh, report it as liters of methane produced per gram of organic matter fed, again, uh, slightly higher for those distillers, grains, uh, digesters. Uh, the, really, the bottom line, though, is methane produced per gram of organic matter degraded. Here we have a p-value of 0.44, so no differences uh, between treatments for how much methane was produced per gram of organic matter degraded. So the organic matter that is degraded is made into the same amount of methane. It's just how well is that organic matter degraded within the digester. Uh, for this trial, we also looked at microbial community analysis. Uh, Simona Fernando would be a microbiologist at University of Nebraska that's really interested in methane production and kind of characterizing that microbial pathway. So uh, we took samples from, the di from these digesters on each treatment at four different time points, uh, did real-time PCR and high throughput sequencing. Uh, we came up with 100,000 sequences 
uh, that we were able to identify. Uh, we then clustered those to 97%, which just means any sequence that was 97% or more alike, we clustered together and call that an OTU, an Operational Taxonomic Unit, which we can really just think of that as separate species. So we start with 100,000 sequences, we cluster them to 10,000 OTUs, and then to really focus on the core uh, microbial population within these digesters, we filtered it uh, to just get the... Uh, microbial species that were present in at least two digesters and at least two sequences in each digester. So then uh, the data that we actually analyzed uh, represented 3,500 OTUs. And uh, these species were uh, identified using the ribosomal database project provided by Michigan State. So if we look at uh, the eubacteria at phylum level, uh, we really see with the distiller screens compared to the control uh, digesters, we see a lot of the same phylum or a lot of the same species even present in both. It's just the abundance of those that changes. Uh, for example, with the distillers, we see more chloroflexy bacteria compared to the control. Uh, we also looked at archaea then. Uh, again, with the distiller screens, uh, we see a higher proportion of methanobacteria compared to control, and with the control we see a few more methanomicrobia, and now we're looking at it at class level. Uh, we put together a principal coordinate analysis then, so this really looks at three things. It looks at who is in these digesters in terms of microbes and archaea that are present and working, uh, how uh, phylogenetically related are they to each other, and how abundant are they. So we see that they really clustered together by treatment very nicely, and we see differences by treatment. So within the red circle here would be archaea and eubacteria present in those uh, distillers, grains, digesters. Within the blue circle, then, is the control digesters, both eubacteria and archaea. So we really see a tighter knit, less variation both within samples and between samples uh, in those distillers, grains, fed digesters. Uh, again, to look at diversity or uh, variation between samples, uh, looking at eubacteria popula uh, populations with the distillers grains, we had 177 OTUs common to all four samples. So right here where all four samples intersect, there's 177 OTUs. With the control then, uh, where they all intersect, we only have 47 OTUs common to all four samples. Uh, same story with the archaea, again with the distillers, 137 OTUs common to all four samples, and 87 with the control. So then moving into our second objective, to look at the impact of housing, uh, this open lot manure is really affected by a lot of things. I tried to just show that it's affected by cattle diet. Uh, it's also highly impacted by environmental conditions. It's open to uh, all environmental conditions, so it's impacted by temperature, rain, wind, uh, animal stocking density, pin cleaning frequency, or distance from the feed bunk. So we have a big change in manure quality as we go from this feed uh, pad right behind the feed bunk all the way to the back of the pin where it's uh, less organic matter. And this was shown really well uh, by a study done in 1974 that characterized uh, that feedlot pin surface. Uh, here we have going down is the depth of the feedlot pin. They took samples starting at the surface and going down, and just how much of that is organic matter. So in the top five to eight centimeters, it's 20 to 25 percent organic matter. As we move down, that gets close to zero. So if we're much below 10 centimeters, we're pretty much just picking up soil or ash and not very much organic matter. So really, uh, when you're cleaning these feedlot pins, it's ideal to just skim the surface and really pick up that organic matter off the top and not dig down into the uh, soil bedding. But uh, when you're using equipment that's this size, it's very difficult to do that. So for our study, we just wanted to take typical feedlot manure that's been collected from those open lot pins and compare that to a pure confinement manure that is uh, strictly urine and feces mixed together. So our confinement manure was 88% organic matter, and the open feedlot manure uh, was 26% organic matter. So that feedlot manure has, it started out as urine and feces, deposited on that feedlot pin surface. It's been trampled, it's been mixed in with the soil, it's been sitting out there for anywhere from 50 to 200 days open to the environment, and it's gone over a lot of changes in that time, uh, where the confinement manure would be fresh, you know, collected about three days ago, pure manure. 
So this was a one six week period with three digesters on the confinement manure and four digesters on the feedlot manure. I have to point out that three of them did fail due to ash buildup within the digester. So the data that I'm going to present next is just on those four remaining digesters that were still working at the end of the trial. Organic matter degradation was higher for that confinement manure, 46.7% compared to 24.8% for the feedlot manure. Methane production, measured as liters per day, again is higher for the confinement manure, 0.478 liters per day, compared to 0.229 for that feedlot manure. Uh, however, liters per gram of organic matter fed uh, is slightly higher for that feedlot manure. Uh, I don't know that that's uh, really, it's not better, but we do know that at least the organic matter in that feedlot manure is at least being degraded and turned into methane. It does seem like it's a reasonable feedstock if we can collect it. So the next step uh, is actually we've come up with a new design. So we're going up to 45 liter digesters uh, with easier ash removal from the bottom of the digester. So if we can uh, maybe remove that ash quickly and more efficiently, we can increase methane production. And then we really want to compare uh, all of these different types of manure. We're going to uh, stay with that pure manure that's over 80% organic matter, kind of as our baseline to compare to. And then uh, different ways of cleaning this uh, feedlot pin and try to get higher uh, amounts of organic matter. So if we just collect manure off the soil surface of the pin, uh, maybe as low as 10% organic matter uh, stockpiled or fresh manure could be 20 to 25% organic matter. And then if we maybe strategically harvest manure just from this cement pad right here behind the feed bunk, uh, and maybe clean more frequently, we could get as high as 50% organic matter. So really, the frequency of cleaning and the area of the pin that you're cleaning affect uh, the quality of the manure that you're getting out of those pins. So feeding the distiller's grains to cattle does improve cattle performance while decreasing digestibility, which then enhances degradation and methane production within those digesters. Uh, we saw changes in the organic matter composition of the manure and changes in the microbial community that help explain this. Uh, open law manure, uh, we think, can be used as anaerobic digester feedstock if that ash buildup can be avoided. And we think it's very important uh, to look at is this a viable feedstock because over 95 percent of the cattle would be in these types of situations so if we can't use that type of manure uh, anaerobic digestion may be limited uh, for beef cattle and with that i'd be happy to take any questions um enjoyed your presentation um i'm just <coughs> surprised to see organic matter that low even on you know, cement pail do you think it's because of the walk-on where it's just um they're collecting the dirt on their feet and carrying it along, and so you're just constantly mixing it. Yep, a good question. So the questions about the organic matter concentration, even off of that cement pad, seems fairly low. Uh, this would be in a uh, feedlot that was in Nebraska. Uh, fairly muddy conditions, so they are bringing quite a bit of mud and dirt up on their hooves onto that cement pad and mixing it in with the organic matter. Uh, it's also, this was only cleaned uh, twice through the feeding period, so this was not frequent cleaning at this point. Uh, we want to go to more frequent cleaning and uh, see what that does to it, but at this point, uh, it was just a two times going in there to clean the uh, manure up off of the cement pad. I should told that, that uh, the people, now that they were Sure, good question. Uh, the questions about putting cement in feedlots, uh, kind of a negative response from the industry really to putting in cement, and I would agree with that. Uh, it would be pretty typical, I might just back up here, it's very typical to have a, uh, a cement pad here right behind the feed bunk, it's only probably a few feet wide. A very, very uncommon to have uh, cement anywhere else in the pin. Uh, we do see a lot of really foot problems, uh, 
you know, a lot of uh, damage to the hoof and things if we have too much cement and they're on that cement too much. So I would agree that uh, there's pushback from putting any more cement in feedlot pins, but I think there's uh, promise in possibly uh, using what's already there with just this little pad behind the feed bunk and collecting manure from that area, which if you have a large feedlot, that adds up to a lot of manure.